While crafting this list, I definitely started by going through some of my favorite games that were notable for their bosses. Yeah, duh, right? But there's definitely certain genres that lend itself better to a list like this. Games with boss rushes, or games with a consistent boss after every level that become some of the most memorable aspects to their game or series. One example of this that I went through plenty of consideration was Toho Project. I love this Bullet Hell series, and the bosses are absolutely the highlight, combining the best of Toho gameplay, memorable characters, and soundtracks that absolutely slap! However, we're not going to be talking about a boss from the main series. Oh no. In 2018, a Metroidvania spin-off was released, Toho Luna Knights, where you play as one of my favorite Toho girls, Sakuya Izayoi, exploring the iconic Scarlet Devil Mansion and taking down the various bosses from the 2002 Danmaku classic. As a longtime fan of Embodiment of Scarlet Devil and well-designed Metroidvanias, I love this game. And it's hard to put into words, but it's such a good translation of Toho gameplay into an entirely new genre. Sakuya is so much fun to play as, and these bosses are just as good as their bullet hell counterparts. Frantically dodging all attacks, mastering your opponent's moveset, and optimizing your own, all while jamming to some incredible remixes. They work so well as both Toho and Metroidvania bosses. And this is all showcased in the final extra boss the original protagonist of EOSD, Reimu Hakure, and she's a force to be reckoned with. So many attacks to learn, such a great test of everything you've learned up to this point, and such a great nod to fans of the series. It really does feel like you're the boss against some plot-armored shonen protagonist, but it does feel nice to finally land the finishing blow and... Wait, why, why isn't the music stopping? Oh, oh god, oh no, oh what is happening, oh, oh god! This boss is so fleshed out and insane, and I love it. Finally beating both phases is such a memorable moment for me. A great Metroidvania and a great Toho game. Please play Toho Luna Knights. If any Xenoblade fans haven't gotten around to playing Torna the Golden Country yet, Please rectify that, it's such a good streamlining of Xenoblade 2's mechanics, an incredible vertical slice of everything I love in this series. I was doubtful a smaller scale RPG would work in Monolith Soft's style, but they wholeheartedly proved me wrong, and it's capped off with an incredible final chapter. At the core of the Torn and Titan, the battle between Aegises, Mithra and Malos is about to take place. A battle only referred to in Legends in the base game, and now you get to experience it firsthand. Better yet, play through it! With this incredibly tight-knit party encouraging each other, a finite number unlike the original XC2, which I felt only accentuates the bonds between the party itself. Malos is indeed waiting at the core, and summons two giant artifices to help it out. It's a great start, and you have to use everything you've learned about Xenoblade's wacky battle system to take down these mechanical monsters. But this fight is only just beginning. The second phase begins, and Malus and Mithra now control their personal artifices in the air above the battleground. And this changes up the gameplay! The party gauge is swapped with the siren gauge, meaning when you build its meter, you command attacks to the mecha above and control the battle in the skies as well. Be warned, Malos has a Siren Gauge too, and an attack from either Artifice locks the other from attacking for a bit. It's so exhilarating and such an amazing detail added in just for this boss fight. Finally, the battle shifts into Mithra and Malos' legendary face-off that causes immense collateral damage and leads into an emotional ending. One that I genuinely love and ends this arc beautifully and perfectly sets up Xenoblade 2 proper. Sure, this fight is mostly a cinematic one, and if you're not a Xenoblade fan, you likely won't jive with the gameplay or story. But if you are one, this whole final act, boss battle and everything around it included, is likely one you won't forget for a long time. Undertale will always be fondly remembered for its boss battles. Many of the lovable attributes that have caused fans to rave about this game, the characters, the music, and unique gameplay, are represented in these gameplay snippets. And so many are some of the most memorable in gaming. Undyne, Metaton, Papyrus, 
Sans. And I think the easy choice for a lot of people in this situation would be the final battle of the whole game. After going through the pacifist ending, you fight against Azriel Dreamer, with the entire cast supporting you. It's a great fight, but for me, there's always going to be a specific fight that I'll never forget experiencing for the first time. The fight with Flowey, the final boss of the first normal ending, is disturbing, insane, and absolutely memorable. A photoshopped mess of a design that puts a whole new meaning on Uncanny, that works perfectly well for Flowey's character. On top of that, this is the first part where Undertale's meta aspects really take center stage, and the manipulation of save states and game mechanics is so cool, especially for your first time fighting this thing. You truly feel helpless against this otherworldly entity. So much of the fight you're just trying to stay alive, and when you finally are able to reach out to the other human souls to rewrite the fight in your favor, it's a wonderful moment. Not to mention the fight ending leads into a great scene with the Warped Flower that continues into the second half of the game proper. Just incredible. This entire fight, at least in my opinion, serves as opening the metaphorical floodgates to the meta-destroying, emotionally gripping, and sheer awe-inspiring journey that is Undertale. Yeah, I mean, of course he's gonna be here. I love Girahim. If you watched my list last year, you might remember Girahim just cracking my top 10 characters, and how he was one of the first instigators of my love for the hammy villain. And that's on full display with his boss battles. Boss battles in Skyward Sword are extremely hit or miss. Battles against Tentalus and the Imprisoned are extremely weak. But fights against Kaloctus and all the Girahim fights are franchise favorites. I love a good one-on-one -on -one sword duel in Zelda games, and the three fights with Girahim are some of the best. Showing off his flamboyant style, and having Link go from an insignificant speck in his eyes to an annoying pest, to finally a worthy adversary deserving of his full attention is a great recurring arc throughout the game. It is that final part of that arc I want to highlight though, where after an intense gauntlet of mooks that just served to stall time for the Demon Lord's ritual, he sees it necessary to handle the problem himself. He reveals his true form, a really cool and sleek design, mimicking a dark counterpart to Fee and showing off his true nature as a dark master sword. Such a cool idea for a character as I talked about last year. Initially, the fight starts as a souped up version of previous fights against Girahim, but on a cool arena hovering above the sealed grounds. Knocking him down to lower levels and dealing a falling strike every time is so satisfying. Then the second phase begins, and Girahim brings out his buster-like sword that you have to systematically dismantle to get to the boss on the other side. Such a great couple of phases that offers a proper send-off to one of my favorite characters in my favorite franchise. Oh, wait, what? Oh shit, did I make a typo and put Hades again? How did that not come up in editing? This is already, oh, that's gonna set me back and reorder everything. It's all edited already? Uh, I guess I can talk about another Hades boss or maybe just toss in a fifth No More Heroes battle, but uh, all right. <laughs> Hades? Who's Hades? Ah, right. There's a lot to love in Kid Icarus Uprising, and one of those aspects is in its characters and writing. I'll admit that I was a bit thrown when in a 25 chapter game, you fought the seemingly final boss in chapter 10, only for Hades to reveal himself after Medusa is defeated, and it's amazing. I love Hades, such a great hammy villain that bounces off the rest of this glorious cast so well. Now for the fight itself. Kid Icarus Uprising chapters are fun, but mostly formulaic, with a flying rail shooter section, an on-foot third-person shooter section, and a boss battle. But for this final chapter, it's all boss, baby. With the entire section being a rail shooter battle between Pit and Hades, and a great intro to start us off. Pit. Hades! Pit! Hades! Pit! Hades! Pit! Hades! Hades. 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 
Yeah, I, I love this game. I think the rail shooter half of KIU is the stronger portions of the game, so I'm glad the game ends on this note, and it's a remarkable battle. Pitt is armed with a mecha-like suit, the great sacred treasure, as he takes on a multi-phased battle with the god of the underworld. It starts off as a fairly straightforward rail shooter sequence, dodging Katie's attacks while you're on the move, until you weaken him enough to force a retreat, and suddenly you're chasing him down and attacking weak points on the offensive. It's such a great test of your abilities in this game, while maintaining a level of fun that the whole game manages to be consistent with. After dealing enough damage and going through multiple forms, you summon an energy sword and cut the monstrosity in half. That doesn't phase Hades as he regrows his legs and you face each other down once more. After another standoff, Hades crushes Pit, causing him to tumble out of the sky onto the land below. And now you're helpless and Hades is charging up when a force is felt, and Palutena asks you to guide this force towards Haiti, keeping your reticle locked on him. And if you succeed, out of nowhere comes Medusa, enraged at being a puppet to the mad god, decapitating Hades with a single punch. How does this happen? I don't know, but it's awesome! That's still not enough as he regrows his head and finishes off Medusa himself! Finally, with a damaged cannon in hand, Pitt tries to charge one last desperate shot dodging Hades' lasers to land the final blow, and doing so is so satisfying, capping off this crazy insane boss battle. This fight just feels so complete, a thrill ride from beginning to end, and a perfect cap off to both a fantastic villain and an underappreciated gem of a game. One shudders to think what an optional super boss would be like in Nier Automata. One of my favorite games ever, it's no stranger to the obtuse and emotional, often employing both at the same time. One of my favorite characters in the whole series, and in general, is Emil, the living weapon who has, let's say, experienced a lot. After his struggling childhood and the events of the first Nier, Emil is well over 11,000 years old. In order to aid Earth in a fight against alien forces from Automata's backstory, Emil used his incredible power to clone himself into an army to combat the invaders. This has led to his memories being fragmented across his clones, and when you come across the most sane version of Emil in Automata, his recollection is cloudy. He's just a head, attached to a roaming cart at this point. And over the course of the game, you learn about what Emil's been up to. This is mainly done through an amazing questline, where you bring Emil numerous lunar tears, which in turn start to jog his memory. Eventually he is able to lead you to an old shack surrounded by lunar tears, which for any Nier fan is definitely an impactful sight. Even Emil doesn't know where the true, quote, original Emil lies, but he remembers enough to know what was important to him. It's great, and makes this entry's boss all the better. This boss can only be accessed once you get every weapon and level each up to their max. No small feat by any means. Once you do so, and go talk to Emil, he will act strange and head towards the desert. If you follow him there, he's lying collapsed, surrounded by gigantic versions of Emil heads before Emil gives a warning. They're still alive. Suddenly, a gigantic, conjoined abomination of Emil heads comes to life, and the boss fight between you and level 99, Emil clones, begins. It's a tough fight, and puts all of your skills in Automata to the test. Emil goes back and forth between his conjoined form and a form where each separately attacks you. All the while, you hear the inner turmoil of these clones, their anger, sadness, and insanity of their eternal life flooding out all at once. The struggle of this poor child conveyed in the raw power of this fight, all the while giving emotional references to Emil's past, certain instances only fans of the original Nier will truly understand. And the Emil in the cart, trying to set them straight, describing the friends he's made and the world he loved. And then once he's down, a choice must be made. In one desperate move, the clones will self-destruct. If you allow this to happen, you get Automata's ending Y, where self-destruction obliterates the surface of the Earth, killing everything. Or, you destroy all of Emil before that happens, saving the world. As Emil is on his last breaths, glad he got to say goodbye to 2B and 9S, or A2 if you're controlling her, and glad he'll finally get to see Nier and Kaine. 
Yeah, so this is an emotional roller coaster, and for a fan of Nier like me, it's got quite a few gut punches. But that's kind of why I play Nier, for these immense and intense payoffs. It just so happens that this iteration of one of those payoffs also has an incredible boss battle to go alongside it. This is very much a non-traditional boss. Hell, some might not even call it one. Celeste is a game that doesn't really lend itself well to that concept. You don't really have an attack, and there aren't too many hostile enemies in the game, just an abundance of various stage hazards. But from a gameplay stance, why Battle-In works so well is that instead of a traditional boss battle, Celeste chooses not to sacrifice any of what makes the game so great. That being it's simple to pick up but hard to master moveset, and the get from point A to point B level design. Except in this case, that point B isn't the next screen, but landing a dash on Madeline, the staple of Madeline's moves. All while Celeste's genius stage designs are on full display, along with Madeline throwing her own attacks in your way to try and stop you. It's a brilliant way of turning this game's platforming gameplay into a one-on-one -on -one duel. And that's just the gameplay. Presentation-wise, oh man, Confronting Myself is one of my favorite tracks in an already stacked OST by Lena Rain. The gorgeous pixel art is on full display in this trippy battle sequence, and of course, the story consequences. Celeste tells one of the strongest stories I've played through in recent memory, and it really comes to a culmination here. While not the final chapter, this is the standoff with the closest thing this game has to an antagonistic force. But she really isn't. Over the course of the game, part of the journey Madeline goes on is to understand that this other part of her isn't something that can or should be separated and tossed aside. Madeline is as much a part of Madeline as any other, and the game and this fight's themes of acceptance of oneself really struck a chord with me. I love this game, and I think a lot of why I love it can be encapsulated with this incredible sequence. A sequence that I always look forward to, whether doing a speedrun or just casually playing through this wonderful experience.